to see you. When I was a youth pastor, I would take kids constantly, especially when I was on the West Coast, down to Mexico to build houses. A lot of youth groups do that, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, some of my fondest memories in youth ministry. And when we would go down, uh, I was always the foreman. I did little work. I got things done through other people is the way that I would put it. And so I just made sure everybody was supplied, everybody was getting along. Uh, we were just doing what we needed to do. That's, that's my role. And I would always choose a student each day to just kind of be my sidekick. There was just going to be a kid that I was going to, uh, I told him I was just training him for leadership on how to solve conflict, how to meet needs, how to work with the family, how to make sure our youth group was all staying on track and mixing their concrete and nailing their boards and doing all of that. And I chose one day this boy named Gabe. Uh, if you're in my Christian life class, you've heard about Gabe and you know where the story is going. Yeah, yeah, Christian life. Yeah, it's a good class. Uh, that, that Gabe, he... He, well, he was a freshman, and he was a little skinny guy, and he's much buffer now because he's actually a drill sergeant for the Marines, and so, yeah, he's crazy huge, and I wouldn't do what I did to Gabe back then if I, if I knew Gabe was going to be like this now, but Gabe was a little bit gullible, so set on being in the Marines, and yet had that Forrest Gump kind of quality, you know what I'm talking about? And so Gabe was my sidekick, so we'd get supplies, we would get water to students, we would work with the family, make sure everybody's, you know doing everything that they need to do. But then every now and then I'd say, Gabe, 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 I need you to go get something for me. Yeah, Bob, what is it? I mean, he was just a yes sir kind of guy. Yes, yeah, Bob, what, what do you need? I said, I need you to go find a board stretcher. And he, what? Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, I said, well, you see this two by four here. Yeah, well, that group over there needs this two by four, but it's a foot too short. You go find the board stretcher so we can stretch this sucker out a little bit. Okay, where is it? I think it's in the back of the truck. Go ask Tony. So he'd run to Tony and to Jack and to this student, and he's just running around looking for the board stretcher. He'd come back in tears. I just can't find it, and get, you know, we'd tell him the truth. And, and I'd do this over and over again. He went searching for a board stretcher. One time we sent him out for a window bender because we had a window that we had to do onto two walls, and so we had to bend it around the wall. Uh, a stucco gun. I went, you know, you put the stucco up. I said, go find the stucco gun, which I say is a great idea. If you've ever built houses in Mexico, somebody invent a stucco gun, I would buy it to this day. But, you know, you shoot the stucco on there instead of smearing it kind of thing. Gabe was a servant, a gullible servant, but a servant. He just simply did what he was told. He just did what he was told. It reminds me back in the day, I, had to, I hated having the answer that I always had for, for this time period right now in, in the school. Where, where are you going for week of E? Where are you going for week of evangelism? What are you doing? Where are you going? What, what exotic place? Are you going on a mission trip? Are you going to some inner city? And I just have to say, I'm going home. I'm just going home, and I would say it like that as if it was an embarrassing thing to go home, see family, and to rest. You know, it's like, well, wait, wait, what are you doing? And you would, you're going home? And you would never dare call week of E spring break. Spring break is what the pagan colleges do. Spring break is bikinis and beaches and beer. We don't do spring break. We do soup kitchens and helping the homeless and feeding orphans. That's what we do. We do week of E, not spring break. You were shamed, or at least I felt like it. I don't think anybody actually shamed me, but you could just tell by the, like the, oh, well, I'm going here. It's like, oh, well, I'm just going to St. Louis. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were shamed if you weren't going somewhere, and it was disgraceful just to go home and rest. It reminds me of Todd Clark, a, a uh, a sermon that I listened to from the North American, and he was talking about how he was headed out for vacation and then some sabbatical time and everything, and uh, one of his church members rebuked him saying, well, the devil's work never stops. The devil never takes a break. Why should we? And he's thinking, well, since when did the devil's work schedule become our role model? You know, it's <laughs> work hard for the Lord 24-7. And then came P. Buck's masterful sermon on Sabbath. I don't know where you're at because I still can't see a thing up here, Peter, but I, I haven't had a chance to thank you. Actually, I have had a chance, but I just wanted to tell you publicly, thank you. Because I've heard student after student say, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Because there's almost guilt in taking Sabbath, of resting and worshiping and turning our rest in to worship. So thank you. He helped realign our, cabin, our, our, our campus on what Sabbath is, rest through worship. And my topic is service. We must go and serve the Lord. It sounds like a burden, doesn't it? 
It sounds like the opposite of Sabbath. As a matter of fact, I think that there's a misconception that Sabbath and service are mortal enemies, but you can have rest while you're serving. Peter displayed that Sabbath is more than just a day off to do whatever you want or to be lazy or just to catch up on on television. Likewise, service is much more than just filling out some annoying form and turning it in to Doug Welch each and every semester to say that, yes, you've advanced the kingdom by leading a small group or whatever it is that you do. I think it's much more than that. As a matter of fact, if that form isn't a reflection of your heart, then you're not really serving the master. I mean, if you're going to blend these topics of service and Sabbath, which is what I feel like I have to do because that's what Matt Stafford asked me to do, and so far I've preached twice in chapel. Here's here's what's happened. I've been in a a two-part series. The first one was with Matt Proctor, and Matt and Luke Proctor went, went first. And then I had to come in and blend the two messages together. Now we've got Sabbath and service, and Peter Buckland goes first, and now he just talked about Sabbath. I've got to blend the two things together, but fortunately I don't have to do it because Jesus does it for us. By the way, I'm not going to jump off the stage and kiss anybody on the front row. You're welcome. All right. Yeah. You're looking nervous, but I'm staying up here this time. We're good. All right. Look up. You... you, you. You're a trip. No, no, that's all right. You know. All right. So look up Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter 2, or Luke chapter 6, any one of those passages of Scripture, because all three synoptics tell the same story. They, the writers paint this vivid picture of Jesus using the Sabbath for service. We always think of Sabbath as rest, but Jesus seemed to flip that upside down every now and then, and he used the Sabbath, Sabbath for service. Could it be the sa- that Sabbath and service actually join hands to defeat the real mortal enemy, and that would be selfishness? If there's, two th- if, there's, if there's one thing that blocks those two components of Sabbath and service, I think it's selfishness. It's selfishness that gets in the way and won't allow those two things to be married or to realign themselves together. And the story goes like this, no matter which gospel account you're in, they're all about the same. Some add different details, but the disciples and Jesus, they're walking through this field of grain, and the grain is ripe, and so they're picking off heads of grain, and and they're rubbing it in their hand, and they're crushing it to where the kernels come out, and then they're popping the kernels in their mouth. Jesus isn't slowing down to any houses or in this field to stop and eat, and so they just keep going. This is their version of fast food. We just have to eat on the go, and so they're they're moving, and, and it's on the Sabbath. Here they are walking on the Sabbath, and here they are eating and and doing this crushing and and popping it in their mouth on the Sabbath. The, the, The Pharisees get all upset about this. They're all upset because of their own traditions and their misconceptions. Jesus, Jesus is going to realign them in just a, se- in a second. But, but he's asking them, why do you allow your disciples to do what's unlawful on the Sabbath? Don't you know that you can't do these sorts of things on the Sabbath? The Pharisees are griping to Jesus about their oral tradition. And if you've been in a gospel class, you've been in Life of Christ, you know all about this. That the Talmud has an, ex- an entire section devoted to all the different minute, minuscule details of the do's and don'ts of Sabbath. The Mishnah. The Mishnah says that you can issue a healthy stoning if somebody continues to break Sabbath tradition and Sabbath law. By the way, do you think do you think it breaks Sabbath to throw rocks at somebody on the Sabbath? Doesn't that just seem like an oxymoron? Like it just doesn't seem to go together. Oh, you're breaking Sabbath. Let me pick up stones and, and kill you with it. That just doesn't seem to jive with me. It sounds like a whole lot of work to me. They're upset because of their own traditions and misconceptions. You're the only one that got it. Bless you. They're upset about their own traditions and their misconceptions. And Jesus then uses two key passages from the written law just to help them understand why what they're doing is okay. He goes back to the days of Abiathar, and David ate the consecrated bread, and he gave some to his own men in 1 Samuel And then he also talks about how the uh, the priests, they serve the people each and every Sabbath day. When you bring your goat, you bring your sheep, they they slit the throat, cook the meat. They do a whole lot of work in their butcher shop. 
And so Jesus points out these two passages of Scripture to say, hey, what we're doing is okay because Jesus uses these scenarios to validate that sabbatical service when dedicated to the good and godly and it benefits the people is okay. And since Jesus is greater than David and Jesus is greater than the priest and Jesus is greater than the temple, then he gets to make the rules. And according to Hebrews 4, he is our Sabbath. And so if you want to do good on the Sabbath, that is okay, according to Jesus. He blends service and Sabbath together. Jesus reminds the religious leaders that Sabbath is to be a blessing, not a burden to the people. He reorients us to the merciful heart of God and the, pur- and the purpose of Sabbath. Service and Sabbath join hands. And even in our own life, the good, for the good of mankind and for displaying Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath and for the glory of God, that is the purpose of service and Sabbath coming together, all simply for the glory of God. Well, I don't think they like the answers that they got from Jesus. And so the next Sabbath day, Jesus is hanging out in the synagogue, and he senses a Sabbath setup. He senses a plot is afoot. You understand what's going on here. They're, they're going to set him up. They know there's a guy with a withered hand in there. I mean, you, you understand being set up, don't you? I mean, imagine late at night walking down the halls of Willie, and you sense a owing. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Tuesday tour people have no clue what I'm talking about. Girls dorms, you don't need to know about owing. It is a disgusting r- ritual that will hurt you very, very badly if, if it happens. But he, you sense that people are going to come and get you. That's where Jesus is at. He knows their hearts. He knows their thoughts. They know that he's being set up, or he knows that they're setting him up. And so he makes good on his Sabbath lordship claim, and he restores the withered man's hand. He brings him up front is it better to do good or evil? Is it better to restore a man or, or, or to kill him? Which is better to do on the Sabbath? And so stretches out his hand and he's healed and the whole place erupts. And after that, he says, after all, doesn't the oral tradition make allowances for animals falling in a pit? Can't you go and pull out your donkey or your goat from the pit? Surely this guy can be an exception to the rule as well. It was the disciples' hands that got him in the trouble the first place, and now it's this man's hand that's going to get him in trouble again. And from that point on, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're plotting Jesus' death. And so therefore, we've wrapped our minds around this Sabbath and service idea that it is okay to do good work, good service on the Sabbath. Do, Do we understand this in our heads? Yes. I would think so. I mean, it's pretty clear from the text. There's not a whole lot more to say about it, that service is validated on the Sabbath when it's for the benefit of people. However, if this story, this story's not over if it's not thumping hard in your chest. Does that make sense? Be careful, Ozark, that the Word of God is not just in your head. It's meant to be there. We back that up with doing tons of memory work here. It should be there. But if the heart of the service of Jesus Christ doesn't beat in your chest, then you're missing your point of being here. For the Son of Man came to what? Serve. Serve. Not to be served. So we've got our minds wrapped around it, but maybe it's a good thing that people in Jesus' day had a misconception about Sabbath and service. I mean, after all, I think it was a good thing for that man that was healed. I mean, Jesus, if you look, this is a healing born out of anger, it says. He looked around at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he was angered with them, and so that's why he called the man up. I know that Jesus wanted to do good in this man's life, but he also wanted to prove a point by restoring this man's life. By the way, with your service and your Sabbath and the blending of the two, what kind of point are you trying to prove with your life? What do you do with that? How do you live that out on a day-to-day basis? Those of us in here with the correct notion of service in our heart, what point are you trying to prove with your life? I mean, if you read Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, you'll see that he makes a distinction in there, or he says that we make a distinction in in America today between service and servanthood, between being a servant and just going out and serving. We make this distinction all the time because when you're a servant, you simply do what you're told. I mean, we could do lost this Greek word all over the place, but I mean, it's, it do, you just do what you're told. 
If your master tells you to do something, you just plain and simply say, yes, sir, and you do it. I call it the Gabe effect. Yes, sir. Even if it's making a fool of me, even if I'm running around like an idiot, yes, sir, I'll do it. And yet, when we choose to serve, we like to set the terms. We like to set the conditions. We like to make sure other people know where we're going and what we're doing. We like to raise the funds. We like, we like to tell everybody else how we're serving. I'm not sure if that's true servanthood. Because when you reject others that are in need, when you're not doing what you're told so that you can do what you want, even in the name of service, it really could be just selfishness, don't you think? It could just be getting in the way of what Jesus really wants you to do. By the way, what, what has your master been telling you to do lately? What, what's he been telling you to do? Have you, have you asked him? Have you slowed down enough to consider? I mean, do you think Jesus is really all that concerned about where you're going for week of E? Maybe he's more concerned about who you're going for. Is it for your glory or for his? Is it for other people's benefit or is it for yours? I mean, if you're going home, are you going home for the glory of God? If you're going overseas, are you going overseas for the glory of God? If you're going to D.C., go for the glory of God, not for your own. And it will always benefit the people. I mean, when you reduce Sabbath to a mere nap and you re reduce service to mere manual labor, selfishness will always replace both. You'll always be tired and you'll never get any work done and God will never, ever get the glory. You will. Servants always do what they're told. And Jesus always seems to be telling us to go for the sake of the good of the people, for the sake of the good news. I mean, religious leaders drove Jesus nuts. We know this. And I think it was, bottom line, just their self-centeredness. Their definitions of work and their rules that accompanied them kept people away from the heart of God rather than leading people towards it. They were driving people away. Church people, we do the exact same thing. Church people drive us crazy, don't they? Church would be easy if it wasn't for all the people. I mean, they drive us crazy because we've got our rules and our rituals and our regulations and our obligations and our squabbling, and we squabble all in the name of me and what I want, and we can't seem to escape it. That's why I need just a good old-fashioned pagan in my life. It keeps my faith straight. You know what I'm talking about? No? Get a pagan in your life. I'm serious. Go find a pagan. Put them in your life. It's healthy. It is a healthy, healthy relationship. Because you get down to the true heart of pointing people to Jesus again. Instead of bickering and squabbling about my way or the highway, the way church should be run and the way that I want it. See, when we merely regulate people's behavior in the church, or we just put up with them even when they're driving us crazy, then we will go crazy and we will burn out. However, when we're agape serving people, it reorients our sanity in Jesus Christ. You find sanity again when you serve people and not yourself. A prime example, this same youth group as Gabe, this, this young lady named Laura that was in the youth group, beautiful musician. She could play anything that she just put her hands on on the stage. Uh, helped start a student worship band with me, and or not with me, but for me because I can't do it at all. And so she, she kicked that off with some other students and uh, a, great, a great kid. And, and she just went through this season of some depression. And her mom was taken into a counselor and she was on some antidepressants and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And there was some family struggles there and there were some relationship issues and some friendship issues. And, and so she's identifying all this. And I was talking with her and her mom one day and we're trying to get down to the bottom of it and what her counselor is saying and everything. And I'm not saying anything bad about counselors or medication when it's needed. I, I understand that whole side of things. But I, I just asked her, I said, well, well, who are you serving? She says, well, I don't know. I said, well, who, who are you serving? She goes, well, I play in the band. I do leadership stuff. I, I help with this and I help with that and I go on trips. And I said, well, who are you doing that for? And she just sat for a long time and thought about it. And she goes, well, I guess mostly me. 
I mean, it's God and me, you know, and she kind of wrestled through that. She goes, I don't know what to do. I said, Let, let's try this. I've got three middle school girls. Two of them play the flute, one plays the piano, and they play very, very badly. <laughs> They're horrible. But they beg me every week that they want to start coming to worship team practice and that they want to be up there. I don't have the heart to put them up there because they stink. <laughs> They're horrible, Laura. She goes, okay. And I said, They're yours. Those are your girls. You, you take them. One of them's not a Christian. Two of them are, are wonderful Christian, Christian young ladies. Just, just take them. They're, they're your girls. Train them. Love them. Be with them. Months go by. She's training. She's loving. She's being with them. We have a, a student leadership meeting. Laura's not showing up. She goes, oh, well, well I'm not going to be there. I said, what do you mean you're not going to be there? You're always here. we got a plan. we got to lead. we got to do this. She said, well, well, I've got my girls. I said, what do you mean you got your girls? It's a Friday. Well, yeah, they're coming over, and we'll practice, and then we're going to uh, paint nails, and then we're going to watch a movie. And I said, what, what are you talking about? She goes, well, I'm doing what you told me to do. Oh. Wouldn't you know it? Had a couple new flute players, new little piano player up there. We're okay. <laughs> they weren't Laura's capabilities yet, but, man, they were, they were good. And they were being led. And they would have went through a brick wall for Laura. They would have done anything for her because she served them. She loved them, and nobody knew about it except for the four of them. I didn't even know that she took that on. Where you're going isn't, isn't necessarily important as who you're going for. That's service. But, Bob, what, what about me? What about me time? I mean, don't you just need some me time every now and then? I mean, don't you just need time to relax, just to be on your own, to catch up on TV or YouTube videos or, or to watch, you know, The Walking Dead and have a marathon with that or Lord of the Rings or whatever it is that you guys do now? I mean, don't you just need some me time? Don't you need your own personal Sabbath every now and then? Don't you dare call your laziness and your addiction Sabbath. Peter set us straight on that. And I wrestled through that as well, and I needed that message more than anything. And I sat next to Lisa, and I said, man, I needed that. And she goes, I know. And she started pointing out ways that she knew that I needed that. <laughs> she really did. Lovingly. I mean, it wasn't like, yeah, you, you need that. I mean, it was lovingly. I didn't mean for that to be a joke, babe. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was... But she knew it as well. Because I've been calling my own laziness and my own addictions Sabbath. Sabbath is not an excuse to be self-centered. Sabbath is a reason to serve faithfully and to worship. So I can't have any me time? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. All I know is I sat in Shane's class one day, and he said, he said it's God first, people, people are next. And then you're not third. You, you cease to exist. You see, my selfishness, it, it gets in the way. I, I can't have Sabbath and I can't really serve because it, it keeps fighting against that selfishness because I cease to cease to exist. I want to exist. I want that me time. And I have this feeling that many in our student body have not thought through much about their selfishness with your precious time here at Ozark Christian College. Any of you that are in my classes, you know, you know how much I love you and how much I love being with you. As a matter of fact, we operate on a system of love in our class, don't we? Why do you work hard? There we go. <laughs> Why do I test you hard? Yeah, you say that so enthusiastically. <laughs> yeah. I go over it constantly, but I wonder if we've thought through our own selfishness here, even at our time at OCC, because maybe we've segregated out, oh, well, I do my Christian service over here, and I go on my week of e-trip over here, and then I've got my, uh, my internship set up for the summer over here, and now over here, well, that's just my class time. Oh, no, 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 we serve one another in the classroom, or have you forgotten your pledge? Way back at the beginning of first semester. We ate together. We laughed. We inaugurated Doug together. And then we pledged together. You remember the pledge, don't you? Or did you throw it away with your plate? You remembered the faculty stood up before you and said, we said that we pledge to do whatever Doug tells us to do. 
We'll teach what he te- tells us to teach. We will, we will do it in a Christ-like spirit. It will be biblically grounded. We will test you fairly and accurately. We will grade fairly. We will love our students as if they were our own children. We committed to those things. But what did you commit to? You committed to working hard and humbly. You committed to turning in your work neatly, orderly, doing what we ask. You committed to showing up on cl- to class on time. You committed to serving us by giving us your own work and not cheating. You committed to being attentive. It's midterm. How are you doing with that? Your grades are being calculated right now. How, how are you doing with that? Regardless of the grade that comes on your, on your sheet, how are you doing serving the men and women that teach you? If they're holding to their end of the agreement, are you holding to your end? I struggle with it. I've had some bomb lectures didn't get a quiz back in time for a lot of my students. I've got to apologize for that. I've had a bad attitude in class, and yes, I have to make things right. And I'm not saying that you're not going to make mistakes through that. But if you're tired of being tired, I bet you it's not because of we're pushing you too hard. I'm wondering if selfishness gets in the way. We entered into an agreement, into a pledge, and I hold to it. I take every absence personally, and I should. And maybe, there's some, maybe it's because I'm a rookie around here. I have no idea. But I take each and every absence personally. I take each and every failed test. Or if I could tell you did sloppy work on a paper, I take it personally as a break of our pledge together. You should take it personally when I break the pledge. What are you going to do about that? I had a student just this week that said, yes, Bob, you're right. Turned in more work in the correct manner for not a grade, but just to honor our pledge together, the code, the vow that we have between one another. How are you doing with serving here? Never, never separate out your service because service isn't something that you do. It's an extension of who you are. Peabock just told me that. It's who you are. And if you cannot serve in this place, then you will not be a servant out in the world because it's who you are. <laughs> I mean, it goes beyond that. I bet your flesh gets in the way more than what we put on you. How late do you selfishly stay up? And how does that affect your attentiveness and your training for Christian service? When do you start reading, studying? When do you start on the projects? How will it affect your habits in ministry? Do we honor the master with sloppy, half-hearted work? I know things happen every now and then, but if it's your habitual pattern here at OCC, then in Christ Jesus, you are better than that. We, together, are better than that. I mean, for crying out loud, foxes have holes, the birds have nests, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head because we've taken all the pillows as we lay around and we mooch off the king instead of advancing the kingdom of God. We're servants. So go and do what you're told. Hold up to your ends of the the agreement. If you've put yourself under the authority of somebody, then you do what you're told every time. When we reduce Sabbath to a mere nap or we reduce service to mere manual labor, selfish will always take over. It It will replace both of them, and you'll always be tired. You'll never get any work done, and God will never be glorified. Servanthood is not what you do. It's who you are. And I found out who Gabe was. For those of you that know the story, you know what's coming and you're already grossed out because I was, I was in this little banyo. You know what I'm talking about? You're out there and there was a six foot hole and a board and, and a curtain and four walls sitting up next to each other and that's where you had to do your business and that's when I'm most thankful that I'm a guy right there. And so I go in there and as I'm doing my business, I'm thinking, you know, well, what can I do to Gabe? Now, I love Gabe so much, but man, he is so gullible. What can I do to Gabe? And so I go running out of the banyo, and I go up to one kid, and I say, I just dropped my wallet down the hole. This is the day before passports. I'm completely lying in the name of Jesus, and it's all justified. It's okay. But, I mean, I needed my license. I was the leader of the group. I had to get them back across the border, and I just, I went up to a student, and I said, I just dropped my, my wallet down the hole. 
I got a flashlight. I can barely see it down there. And man, it's gross, but I can't fit down there. Will, will you go down there for me? They just walk away like I was nuts. Like, nope. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> Enjoy Mexico kind of thing. <laughs> and so I'm running to student after student. I'm saying, I can't fit down the hole, but look at you. You're a, you're a stream being. I can, I can like lower you down there. You can, you know, flash like gloves. You can, you can get that out. I go up to Gabe and I said, Gabe, I can't fit down the hole. Will, will you go? And he, and he looks and no, get out of here. He goes, I want to see it. So we walk in there and we're staring down the hole together. And, you know, we're looking down there. Somebody opens up the curtain. What the heck are you two doing in there? Well, we're looking down the hole. You know, we've got a light. I, well, I can't see it anymore. I don't know where it's at. And he goes, no, it's not. And he's, you've been messing with me. No game. I'm serious. And I mean, a little tear started to form and go, go down my eye. I mean, I'm a good liar. It's good. <laughs> Gabe, I need your help. To which he took a deep breath. He just goes, okay. I go, what? <laughs> he goes, well, can I get some gloves? I said, yeah. And so he went and got gloves. And boy, he wasn't running around. He was just moping like this. <laughs> you got any gloves? So he gets his gloves and he comes back. And I'm like, all right, bud. Now, you think I've taken it too far. Oh, no, there's more. <laughs> I said, I think what you're going to have to do is get on your hands. And I'm going to hold up your feet. Stick this little flashlight in your mouth. Let's go, buddy. To which he took a deep breath. Gabe's going down the waste hole for me. We need to think about this for a second. To which he got up on his feet or up on his hands, and I grabbed his ankles, and then I go, Gabe, I'm just kidding, man. Thanks, but no. To where he about killed me. <laughs> And after his hands were down there, I was like, I don't want him touching me. It's like I'm squirting hand sanitizer at him instead. You know, uh, I can't believe that kid was going to do that. He had resolved in his mind. He was going to just do what he was told. Later on that night by the campfire, I was sitting by him. I honored him as servant of the week. You know, I had to do something. You know. <laughs> but then... Between a worship song, I was like, Gabe, why in the world were you going to do that? I was like, you, you know, you could have thought that through. I could have gotten a new license. Hello, I'm very, very white. They'll let me back across the border sometime, you know. <laughs> it, why'd you do that? Well, I didn't want to leave you stuck here. I just couldn't leave you stuck here. That's all he said. Gabe promised me that he would do what he's told, and he showed the extent the extent of his love. I was told to preach on service. Peter was told to preach on Sabbath. We can't just leave you stuck here with misconceptions about either one of those two God-ordained things. Sabbath and service need to be married together. When you reduce Sabbath to just a nap and you reduce service to mere manual labor, selfishness will always replace both. You'll always be tired. You'll never get any of your work done, and God will never be glorified because servants of Jesus just need to do what they're told. Servants of Jesus are always led to people. So go and do good to people. Share the good news with people. So maybe a better question than where are you going for week of E is who do you know that's stuck? They're stuck. You may need to climb down a nasty waste hole I have no idea. I do know, though, you'll need to do what you're told. So go do what you're told. Father, we thank you that we're your servants. We're humbled and honored. Tell us what to do, and we'll do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we've got a couple.